Guest host Bob Nitrio joins us this week to discuss news from HPE, Nerdio, WatchGuard, and Axiant. We break down Kaseya's IT Complete as a name to know and find out why security vendors are eyeing MSSPs. It's Channel Pro Weekly, episode 137, Honey Netbooks with Nuts. Today's episode is sponsored by Corporate Armor. Get free remote support software exclusively from Corporate Armor. Stop spending big money on expensive remote desktop tools and use Corporate Armor Connect and Fix for free. Connect and Fix is secure, reliable remote desktop software that enables you to support clients and fix their technology issues remotely from anywhere, anytime. Connect and Fix runs in a fast, secure cloud offering commercial grade and compliance friendly remote desktop and support technology for free. It includes features like file transfer, session recording, restart and reboot, and live video and text chat on PC, Mac, and Linux platforms. Users can even share their screens with clients for presentations or training purposes. So stop paying for remote access and support software and switch to Connect and Fix by Corporate Armor. They take the pain out of sourcing IT products. Find them at CorporateArmor.com. Again, that's CorporateArmor.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Channel 4 Weekly, episode 137. My name is Matt Whitlock, technology editor, online director, and you are captain of this pirate ship sailing through the MSP waters. My first mate, uh, as you know, each and every week is here. He's the first mate that's high in demand. You can't even book him for children's birthday parties. Executive editor, Rich Freeman. This is not true, actually. I am absolutely available for... Uh children's birthday parties. And, uh, you know, if, if, if I need to kind of work with the balloons or something and make the animals for people, I, I can do that for you. Now, now, since do you actually dress up in your pirate outfit at, uh, at children's birthday parties? Uh, no, I, I actually, I dress up uh, the same way I dress up to every Halloween party I, I go to as a magazine editor. I'm actually wearing the costume now. That's a good costume. And it, it, uh, that takes a lot of time and effort to put on every day, I can imagine. It, it does. It does. Yeah. Now, you, you can see, today, for folks watching on video, you can see the effort I put into this. <laughs> it is amazing. And hey, we got, a, we got a guest host smiling over there. Uh, CEO of Rabbit, uh, sorry, CEO of Ranvest Associates, Bob Nitrio is here. Hi, Bob. Well, good morning, gentlemen. You guys are killing me already over here. <laughs> I don't know how I can keep up with you two. Oh, I am so excited to have you here. Um, Bob, we've known Bob for many, many years. He's attended many of our shows, one of which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but he's, uh, he's, he's a kind of a staple in the industry. He's been well, well accoladed, accoladed, if that's a word. I'm, it's my word today, accoladed, uh, talked about. And it, Bob, you're just a hell of a nice guy. I'm so glad to have you here. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you two. You two are my best friends. <laughs> and speaking of a very snappy dresser, I love that shirt. Well, thank Where'd you, you have a um, nasty reputation of wearing tropical shirts, and so I just try to keep up the image as best I can. Oh, it's fantastic. It, you, it is Arizona, so, you know, lightweight shirts in the summertime is a good thing. It Outside is. Outside my window here today, it's been pouring off and on. The humidity <laughs> in this room is about ready to kill me because we haven't turned on the air conditioner yet because it's not summer. <laughs> but, uh, hey, I'm not complaining. We love it here. So yeah, I bet it gets pretty. What is it? What is a peak temperature summertime where you're at? We spent last summer was our first summer here, and I think we got to like 115, 118. And believe it or not, it was really very manageable. Both my wife and myself said, "This is child's play." We were used to getting up to kind of those temperatures periodically in Sacramento and in Eastern Washington State as well. Um, it was relatively mild last year, so you know who knows? We may get to the 120s this year, but. It's okay. You know, you just dash between air conditioned places and it's fine. Yeah, I hear humidity has a, a lot to do with how hot it actually feels. Because I know like around here, we can get up into the hundreds, like low hundreds. But if it's like 100% humidity, it, it feels like hell. Exactly. And so being a dry heat here, it is really actually quite manageable. And it makes your body feel good too. It gets rid of all those creakinesses that you have in that humid area like Northern California. Now I feel like the ju- joints are all nice and loose and I'm limber and I'm ready to, well, I better not say what I'm ready to do. That would be profane. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So Bob, for, for those who may not know who you are or uh, a little bit about your, your company that you, uh, that you work for there, what, tell us about you and what you do. Sure. Well, um, originally I was involved as an apartment developer and a uh, commercial general contractor um, when I was up in Eastern Washington State. We moved the business to Sacramento, and then my partner decided 
Too many people couldn't stand the size of the area, so he split back up to Washington, and I stayed in Sacramento. Having grown up in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was a natural move for me, but it was very unnatural for him. So long story short, uh, couldn't find a good replacement for him. One day, my best friend in the Bay Area, who was a real estate broker and property manager, calls and said, my secretary is leaving me. What do I do? I said, we do lunch tomorrow. So we did lunch and uh, gave him a lot of advice and I got him computerized. And the next thing I know, within 90 days, he, after telling all his friends about me, I'm in the computer consulting business. And so I said to my wife, I've just built my last building. <laughs> I am now going into business and technology consulting. And that's how the business started about almost 30 years ago. Um, primarily, I have always led with business consulting because I have a degree in finance and a master's in business administration. And that actually served me very, very well because it created relationships with my clients that were far different than just the technical type of relationship of somebody that was providing computers and softwares and network management. Um, so now that I have moved from Sacramento to Arizona, I have entrusted that business to one of my colleagues, and now I am doing marketing um, components, videos, webinars, and other things for a software development company in Sacramento with whom I am in partnership. And that company provides uh, basically instant access to, to customizable mobile apps, but we've removed focus from that now to being able to deliver instantly mobile app workflow solutions, which don't require the download and installation of a customized app. So it's been very interesting, and I do, like I say, a lot of, um, a lot of um, videos, a lot of cartoons, a lot of explainers, and it's really tapped into my creative side, so it's been a lot of fun, and that's what I concentrate on these days. That is very, very neat. And you said you, you and how long have you been doing the, the video side of this? Uh, um, I've been working with video probably for about five years, but I would say for the last three years, I've really been getting intense... Um, uh, immersion into the video side of it. And it's been really interesting working both with audio, video, uh, both in terms of taking a uh, PowerPoint presentation and making it really come alive. Um, the latest thing we've done without voice narration is to try to tell the story in 90 seconds or less about a specific point, uh, just having music in the background, but letting the slides do the talking. And it's a little different approach where typically I would have three talking points, no more, no less on every slide, because we remember things in threes. But this case, you have one idea on each slide and you're trying to tell that story sequentially very quickly. And uh, it's quite a challenge, but it's, um, it's actually something that turns out quite well. Very good. Now, what, what was the hardest thing? Because you said you were, you were building apartment buildings and, and that kind of thing. What was the hardest thing that you found transitioning into the IT space uh, as opposed to building apartments? Was it, um, were you able to keep up with the, the, how rapidly things change or what, what did you find the most interesting or most, or most challenging? Well, I think being able to transition into um, Windows networking was the biggest challenge because we were a small company in the construction business. We're a two person shop. We bought a $25,000 PC back in 1978. My partner was about ready to have a heart attack when we did that. But I said, don't worry, we're gonna make it all back the first year and more, and we did. Literally, we ran that business with two people. I was Mr. Inside, he was Mr. Outside, and uh, that was based on uh, CPM as the operating system, the precursor to DOS. Well, I think when I went into consulting, I had to really extend myself very, very quickly to go from being uh, familiar with desktop software to being able to do networking. And there was a transition in there with a company out of Texas, I think it was called the Net Solution, which really didn't require an OS, but it had embedded hardware that allowed you to do printer and file sharing. And that's where I started, but I quickly realized that I had to get into Windows Server, and that's, that was a big challenge. Very, very cool. And, uh, and uh, family, kids, anything like that? 
uh, we are all only children. My wife, my daughter, myself, and my granddaughter. We're, that's it. The width is four of us. That's the end of the line. And, uh, and one of the reasons we moved here was because my daughter and granddaughter had moved here for health reasons. And so now we're just a few blocks apart. And uh, today is actually my granddaughter's 11th birthday. And she's coming over for a fabulous roast turkey dinner at her request. Well, congratulations and happy birthday to her. Uh, I, I also have an 11 year old, my, 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 and my daughter just turned 11 last week. So uh, Isn't it, fun? it is a great age and they are full of spunk. And from here on out, it's, uh, it's the growth and development of attitude. So well, good for her. Happy birthday to her. Um, so we are gonna, we're gonna cruise right along here and Bob, you're gonna be with us the whole show. I'm so excited. Um, lots of things for you to chime in on and I'm looking forward to your perspective. So Rich, the first thing that I'd like to do is cover, uh, kind of, obviously we didn't do a show last week and why don't you tell us why? <laughs> so, uh, you know, sorry to have missed you uh, uh, last week, podcast listeners, but Matt and I were both in Dallas attending the first uh, Channel Pro SMB Forum event of 2020. Uh, we are doing five this year. We, we've been doing four of those a year for a number of years now. We've expanded to five this year. Um, Dallas was the first one. And uh, it was great. Uh, you know, great crowd. Um, really, really happy with uh, the way the content when, for, for me, this is always like, um, you know, opening day or, or uh, whatever. There's a lot of planning that goes into the content at these shows, but you never really know how it's going to work until you actually, you know, part the curtains, if you will, and put people on stage. But I, I, it went great. Um, and we got really strong evals from, uh, from the audience. So, uh, yeah, really a good time and a great show. Yeah, I agree. I think the content went well, and we always use the first show to kind of tweak a little bit. But fortunately, I, it, everything worked out, I think, pretty well. Um, there was a really fun session with Manuel Palachuk this year. What's the people about that one? Yeah, you know, we're, we're always kind of looking for, and this is a, a theme for regular podcast listeners. They'll, they'll, uh, you know, know this idea that if, if you are a, uh, a regular channel pro, uh, reader or a, a regular member of our audience on the podcast, we're, we're all about feeding you your broccoli because you do need to eat your broccoli, but we want it to taste good. We're, we're looking for ways to make this meal, um, tasty uh, for you and keep you entertained as well as educated and informed. So we love um, session formats that are a little bit different and a little bit fun. And uh, Manuel Palachuk and Ran Buccianico came up with this great idea. They're, they're both kind of fans of escape rooms. Um, and they thought, what if we could create some escape room-like experience and build a, a managed services uh, uh, advice session around that? And so they, um, that, that's what they did, uh, basically. So it, um, they sort of tag teamed offering advice on either um, metrics that you should be tracking or, um, uh, you know, operational uh, enhancements that you can do to make your MSP business more profitable. Uh, and at the conclusion of each one of those little lessons, they would give you a clue. And then at the end of the session, using those clues, there were these little treasure chests on the, uh, on the tables. And the, you know, first person to, um, solve the riddle, if you will, and get into the treasure chest, won a, a prize. So it, it was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and it, it's something we've never done before. So there were some hiccups in terms of the, the logistics and so on and so forth. But um, it, a very fun session. And as usual, um, with Manny and Rayanne, really, really great, um, you know, smart ideas for MSPs. Yeah, that was one. And that was a, a everyone seemed really into that one, trying to figure out the cipher to the to the code so they could get into the, to the lock box. Of course, there's always that one guy that's like, Oh yeah, I just hacked the box and you know, got <laughs> in. but that's fine. It, they don't see that. Those are the people that kind of take the fun out of things. Um, but it, it, put fun into almost anything. <laughs> right. Uh, exactly. he, he's a very funny guy and you have to be careful around him because he does the unexpected. <laughs> that, that he does. Uh, but the Dallas crowd was great. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fears kind of swirling around and I think we'll talk about that in a second more on this whole, uh, Right now we're in the midst of this coronavirus kind of pan, uh, panic right now that's that's hitting the airwaves. So we were a little concerned, kind of being at the forefront of this, of how many people are going to show. But it was a great crowd. Everyone was there to uh, have a good time. And um, I do my, uh, my Tech Trends uh, game show on the, on, the, on the fourth year of that. We're doing a Family Feud uh, this year for the cities that didn't get to see it last year. And um, 
Rich, you can always tell a, a, a great crowd when they really, they come in from lunch and they're all like zombies, you know, because they've been walking the show floor and talking and networking and getting tchotchkes and stuff like that. And then they sit down in the room and then they, they go back in their chair like, <laughs> you know, and they're like half asleep. But then by the time you get midway through the game, like, you know, you're in a great city when they're all like up and perky and having fun and yeah, having a good time. And I caught that this time around. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, m my role in this session basically is to work the, the scoreboard. M Matt has created this um, very realistic, um, you know, tech trends feud uh, game board. And so I'm up on stage, you know, just controlling the game board, basically. But it means I can see the entire audience. And um, so I, I was, you know, watching faces and so on. And yeah, it, it, people were definitely enjoying themselves. Yeah, they had a great time. So it's a good, good city. I'm uh, uh, so happy for all the folks there. And for, for people who don't, uh, the, the theme for our tour this year is called the Game Theory Tour. So, Bob, we had all kinds of fun stuff. We we're kind of playing off that. So, for example, we have these T-shirts that people see here. This is the Game Theory Tour T-shirt. That's a little out of focus, but. That should be a collector's item. It's, it's an awesome. This is like the coolest T-shirt I think we've ever, we've ever had. Uh, so I'm rocking that today. Um, we had our cocktail reception party. So we had this kind of last minute idea of hijacking our digital signs and putting up like getting a couple like game controllers. And we had um, an, the actual like Pac-Man uh, arcade game and Donkey Kong. So you could walk up to the table, pick up the controller and you could play um, uh, Pac-Man or Donkey Kong. That was fun. You know, so we had all these kind of theme elements going off. Our shows are a great time. Uh, I highly, highly recommend events.channelpointnetwork.com. Uh, go and sign up for one of our next four shows. If you're in the DC area, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, Boston, and uh, City of Industry. So anywhere in LA, you get to City of Industry pretty easily. Um, sign up and, and come and have a great time. And you learn a lot. Like I said, Rich, Rich is like, you eat your broccoli, but you don't realize it's, it's broccoli because it's covered in, in cheese. Can I throw on a shameless plug for you guys? Yeah, now Bob, now, Bob, you've attended many of our shows. Why, so don't yeah. listen to us. Listen to Bob. Bob, tell us about, tell people about our shows. There are a lot of industry events out there that people can choose to go to, but I have to tell you, consistently, the content that Channel Pro Networks has put into their events is extraordinary. Um, quite honestly, the one that was in San Jose last year, last year's program, I think was one of the all-time best. And uh, the price is right. The venues are always convenient. And you really do yourself a disservice if you don't go to one of these events at least once every year or two when they're kind of close to you. And if they're not close to you, get a cheap ticket and go anyway. <laughs> You're not going to be disappointed. Well, well said. And, uh, and, and for those who maybe can't fly, we, we also do have some online summits that we do, which are kind of a, kind of a little bit of a virtual event. Um, so if you really can't, if we're not near you uh, and you can't hop on a plane, uh, definitely plan on attending these online shows that we do because you still learn a lot. They're still very informative. Uh, and then you can attend, you know, in your underwear and your desk. You know, I don't judge whatever you wear at your desk. It's, that's up to you. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely do those. And you can find out information about all of those events.channelnetwork.com. Uh, Rich, we have a word about our DC event. Do we want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, let, let me go ahead and do that. Because I mean, as it happens, um, I sent an email out to the uh, speakers uh, at this year's events last night on this topic. Because, you know, obviously there have been a ton of events in the industry canceled just, just within the last week, week and a half and so on. So, um, you know, so we uh, anticipated that some of our speakers might be wondering, well, is the Channel Pro event going to get uh, canceled and, and so on? And people who might be considering attending might be wondering about that too. So. Um, what I basically told the speakers last night is, look, we, we are monitoring the situation um, with coronavirus just like everybody else. Um, priority number one at Channel Pro is making sure that we make the right decisions for our audience and our speakers and our sponsors and our own team. Right now, as, as we look at things, we really feel like we can still safely and responsibly host a live in-person event in Washington, D.C. The, the next event on our calendar is um, May 6th in uh, the Washington, D.C. area near Dulles Airport. And we feel like we can still do that. So we are not canceling that event. Um, we very much encourage people to register for that. At the same time, of course, as we all know, because um, we're watching the news these days, and the situation changes kind of rapidly. It changes a lot um, these days. So conditions could change between now and then. And therefore, um, in parallel right now, 
we are already planning a sort of virtual version of that DC event, um, which would feature the same speakers for the most part, same content. It would just be delivered to you online. And so the, the message there basically, look, if you're um, interested in attending, um, don't let concerns uh, about uh, you know, whether or not this event is gonna uh, be canceled dissuade you from registering. Go ahead and register because you're either going to have the opportunity to attend that in-person event or if conditions change, we can't do it live. The event will still happen. It'll just happen uh, online and you know, we will send you all the information that you need to, uh, to attend virtually. So that you know, the, the show will go on, um, folks. Uh, right now we think it'll go on uh, face-to-face if that isn't possible at some point, um, it'll go on anyway, and we'll just do it on your computer screen. No, no reason not to go and register and, and be ready. Because as, as Bob has said, the content is fantastic. You absolutely want to be a part of it. And uh, hopefully, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that we can still do it in person. I'm, I would like, I like the live shows, being able to meet everybody. And it's not like we're, you know, a $10,000 attendee show where have people fly in from China. I mean, we're, we're a regional show that's still relatively you know small so i think i think we'll be okay but we'll see we'll watch, we're watching it because i certainly if things change i certainly don't want to like put myself at risk right so we'll uh we'll just see how it goes awesome well we are gonna uh switch gears here and we are gonna flip over to the news uh and we've got a lot of different stories to talk about so we've got um some stuff from hewlett packard nerdios in the news watch guard and axion so we got a lot to cover uh, and we're going to go ahead and start with our first story, which is HP Enterprise has some compact microservers uh, aimed at SMBs. Rich, tell us about those. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, news this week from Hewlett Packard Enterprise. A um, few years back, they introduced a product called um, ProLiant Microserver Gen 10. And it was this very compact, very SMB focused um, server product. Uh, that had, you know, they've been building into um, various small business solutions and, and selling uh, on its own into the SMB market ever since. Um, what they announced this week is that they have updated it. So there is now a, a new version of the product called the ProLiant Microserver Gen 10 Plus. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it follows, it, it, they've added a lot of things to it that I'll talk about here briefly, but I mean, just in terms of the form factor, um, they're really sort of sticking to the pattern that they established when they um, first introduced the product, except that it's even smaller now. So the new version is um, 9.65 inches by 9.65 inches by 4.6 inches. So, you know, the way HPE describes it is roughly the size of a hardcover book. Um, I believe it's about 10 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. It's a very lightweight, very compact, doesn't require uh, a lot of space. One of the things they really focused on in this update is um, noise, noise level, and the um, goal that they set for themselves was that they wanted this product to be quiet enough to use in a public library. Um, and so they, they it's, you know, it comes in at 36 decibels, uh, apparently, which is uh, quite quiet. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the way they did that, the way they accomplished that actually, in, in some respects is really, really obvious, and um, in others is kind of ingenious. Um, they just basically took the power system out of the box and created an external power supply. So, it, you know, it, it work, you plug it into the wall exactly the way you plug a laptop into the wall. There's a, uh, an external power supply that you plug the device into and, and then plug into the wall. And by doing that and taking the um, power system outside of the box, less heat, less heat means no fan, which means it's quiet. So what are they cooling the processor with? What's that? What are they cooling the processor with then? Because there's, there's still a lot more active cooling that most servers need for CPU and, you know, RAM and that kind of stuff. Are they I mean, it, it could be a smaller fan, um, you know, that they, they need, I, I don't know, um, if it's just, uh, uh, you know, air cooled or if there's a, a fan in there. But I mean, obviously, the power supply is a big source of heat. And so by taking yeah. that off, they were able to uh, quiet the internal operation of the device. Uh, in terms of processors, you get two two options. The the um, sort of cheaper of the two is a uh, two core Pentium uh, chip. There's also a four core Xeon E class processor for uh, more performance sensitive workloads. Um, up to 32 gigs of RAM, up to 16 terabytes of internal storage. Um, they have built in some um, software to this version of the product uh, now. So first of all, the, um, HPE has this technology. Uh, that they call the silicon root of trust. And uh, you know, 
technology may not even be the right word for it, but I mean, basically it's a whole kind of design or a, a construct manufacturing process that from beginning to end, from the construction of the device to its delivery to you, they have uh, measures in place that make sure the device is not tampered with. Um, so that security technology is now built in um, standard to uh, all these microservers. Um, they have a special edition of their uh, integrated lights out monitoring and management tool. So ILO uh, is a product that HP has offered for a while. It is now bundled in with the server, um, but they've created a version of it that sort of partitions out, sort of segregates out the um, remote access uh, feature or remote control feature of that product. And the idea being that way, um, an MSP who wants to sell uh, that as a service, the ability to provide remote support through that tool can can do that while you know um, potentially providing access to the rest of the tool uh, to the customer. Um, they've equipped it. They're now using their rapid setup software, which they use with some of their other other products with this one as well, um, which they say should reduce setup time by 35 percent and um, uh, in some cases, allow uh, uh, an MSP or, or other IT provider to set this product up without actually having to roll a truck out there. It's, you can kind of um, walk a customer through it. So um, in interesting product. And then I, uh, the last critical thing to mention is just the financial piece of it. So if you want to buy it the old-fashioned way and just uh, cut a check, um, pricing starts at around $700. But um, for the first time now, you can actually buy this on an as-a-service kind of basis for as little as 20 bucks a month. So um, HPE announced uh, last June that um, eventually within the next few years, everything they sell will be available as a service. And um, that now includes this product. You have the option of uh, doing it with uh, monthly installment payments and you can kind of build in a, a refresh uh, plan with that as well. So Richard, did they say kind of what the Intended use case for a server this size is, I, I think, edge computing, but it seems like they're, they're making a little bit broader than that. No, you're absolutely right. So um, edge computing is one of the, the use cases. Broadly speaking, they're, they're thinking about either um, small businesses, so up to 25 users, or um, remote, like branch offices. Um, so th there could be an enterprise play here for a, a company that has uh, branch sites. Uh, it's, it's designed for use by small businesses, and like you said, it's also a, a handy edge computing device. Very cool. Bob, how many, how many are you going to get? Uh, I think we better order at least one to play with, right? <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because, you know, many of us that dealt with uh, the small business server from Microsoft, I was with it from day one. Uh, I saw the potential of it immediately, and then when they transitioned out of that, went into Essential Server, there was a a lot of uh, gnashing and weeping and gnashing teeth weeping and so forth because it turned out that small business server had really hit a product niche that was perfect. Small businesses could now really operate more like a large business but without all of the cost. I find it interesting now that as we transition a lot of work to the cloud that there's very little need in many small businesses for any on-site uh, servers. A lot of my property management companies, which was my special vertical niche, um, were able to transition very successfully to hosted property management software. Uh, took away the need for the infrastructure for the server, took away the need for their backups, took away their need for anything other than really good connectivity through that uh, internet connection. Uh, so I'm sure that there's gonna be some plays and some businesses where they still want something on site um, and there's going to be a, a, a great opportunity here for this little device to do that. Um, I, I still think as Microsoft moves away from the essential server now and that role in its Windows server, as they go more and more toward pushing hosted everything, uh, I think there's an opportunity here for HP. Um, that said, I think one of the most interesting things I found in this story was the fact that HP is moving to everything as a service with its hardware. And I think that coupled with cloud services is a, another element in the change for the way we do business for small businesses. Yeah, I mean, it, isn't it interesting how quickly, and th this has been evolving for a number of years, but it really does feel like it, it's been a, a dramatic um, and relatively swift change where um, 
end users increasingly want to buy everything technology that way. You know, they, they've gotten accustomed to that monthly payment from cloud software uh, and, and they like it. They like, you know, making IT a, an operational expense and they're, they're pressuring uh, hardware manufacturers and distributors and their partners um, to provide technology that way. And so, yeah, it's, it's um, very much of a course with what's happening in the industry broadly that HPE has said, we're going to give you that option for everything we sell. When you think about that book, The Big Switch, uh, this is pretty much it, utility computing. Turn it off, turn it on, that's kind of where we are these days. And I'll, I'll follow up on something else you said there um, it, to the cloud uh, piece of this story is something I, I left out before, which is just that there are um, hooks, if you will, in this product um, specifically for hybrid computing scenarios and um, Microsoft Azure in particular. So they, they really do have a hybrid deployment model um, in mind as something that a lot, if not most customers are going to want to do. And they have um, set the product up to support that kind of mode. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very cool. Um, so 700 bucks, or you can buy it as a service for 20 a month. As they say, it's uh, about the cost of a Netflix subscription. So, but that's, that brings a hard choice for, for a lot of people, Rich. Do you want a server or do you want Netflix? <laughs> well, let's think about this for a minute. Here's oh, no. terabytes of internal storage. I mean, you could load a lot of movies onto that thing. You could, but... Not the originals, right? No House of Cards. No, I don't even know what shows Netflix has anymore. That's how little TV I watch. Well, some people will choose Netflix. I recommend the server because servers are fun. Uh, all right. You mean there's no, there's no serial called Microsoft's Greatest Hits? <laughs> there, there, there should be. There, there should, should be. be. We need, you know... We need, you know what we need, Rich? We need a line of um, enterprise and small business technology uh, breakfast cereals. <laughs> so yeah. like, you know, server O's, right? With like little marshmallows that have like, um, you know, uh, little RAM chips and, you know, I don't know. I, so, something like that. Then there could be like um, IoT Netflix. flakes. Netbooks with nuts. <laughs> Netbooks with nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, we got to get on this. Uh, yeah. who, do we have any contacts at like General Mills or Kellogg's or anything like that? I, oh, this is going to be coming to us. <laughs> if any of them listens to this podcast, yeah, the, the phone's going to start ringing. Cause right. Cop copyright Channel Pro 2020. Nobody take our idea for, uh, for, ser for server O's and uh, netbooks with nuts. <laughs> and it's derivative, honey netbooks with nuts. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nerdio's in the news. Uh, another big thing, we're, we're talking edge servers, which is kind of a, a, a recent trend, but another big, big one that we've been talking about here and there is Windows Virtual Desktop. Now, Nerdio's no stranger to virtual desktop solutions. Um, so what do they got for us today, Rich? Yeah, you know, it, it's not that long ago that we had Nerdio's uh, CEO on the show, Vadim uh, Vladimirsky, to talk about Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, so Nerdio, for folks who don't know them, they, they specialize in, well, these days they, they really um, specialize in um, standing up and, and managing complete um, Azure-based uh, environments, Azure-based workloads. And right now, um, something like 60 to 70% of the sales leads they're getting are related to Windows Virtual Desktop, or, or WVD, um, which is the, the latest sort of big um, addition to the Microsoft Cloud portfolio. It's a complete... Windows 10 um, virtual workspace uh, a kind of solution, um, uh, obviously in a multi-tenant kind of environment. And uh, a lot of folks, myself included, kind of think it's the next Office 365, that I, over time as people um, become more uh, acclimated to it and aware of it and so on, um, you know, everyone who is selling Office 365 or Microsoft 365 today is going to be selling WVD as well, because um, there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of demand for this product. And uh, like I said, there already is. In fact, Nerdio has already done something like a thousand WVD rollouts for customers. And what they have discovered along the way is that you know their specialty is coming into uh, a company that has nothing sort of Azure based and just creating that entire environment for them from scratch. But as you get into mid-sized companies and above, um, it turns out there are a fair number of companies out there that already have some Azure infrastructure. And they don't want to recreate that. They want to use what they've already got and just um, put WVD on top of that. 
Um, so Nuri has introduced a product basically that's designed specifically for that kind of use case. If you serve mid-sized businesses or bigger than that, um, you now have the ability to layer WVD on top of a customer's existing um, Azure assets. Um, and then there are also, so what the Nerdio folks also discovered as they have been doing these thousand uh, WVD rollouts is there are customers out there as well with um, security and compliance concerns um, about rolling out WVD in the traditional way. So. Some businesses, and we could argue whether or not this is merited, but there are businesses out there that don't love the idea of having a third party like an MSP managing their um, Windows desktops through a multi-tenant management tool that they're also using to support other customers with. Um, so this new uh, Nerdio product, which is called Nerdio Manager for WVD, it has its own dedicated management plane that is customer specific. So if you use this to set up w, WVD for a particular customer, there is a management tool that comes with that, but it's specific to that customer. It's not a multi-tenant tool. Um, you as an MSP can use it if the customer gives you access rights to it, but anyone who's concerned about you know, a shared management um, experience doesn't have to worry about that here. And then the other thing um, that the product does is kind of put you in control of um, settings like uh, data residency. So if, if you are working with a client who is uh, subject to a data privacy regulation that includes some sort of data residency requirement in terms of where the data must live geographically or where it can't live, um, that can be very difficult to control with a lot of um, virtual desktop uh, solutions, but um, this product allows you, puts you in control of that and allows you to specify what you know, region uh, the data is going to stay in. And then one of the, you know, the last thing that the Nerdio folks emphasize about the product is it's, uh, it's an overlay on top of an existing Azure environment. So you can just add it very easily to that existing environment. And if you're done with it, you don't want to use it anymore, you can take it out just as uh, easily. There, there are other um, ways to deploy virtual uh, workspaces out there from, you know, the Citrixes and VMwares of the world. Um, those products often involve a proprietary element that can make migrating your desktop onto a different platform a little tricky. The Nerdio folks are trying to make a, uh, a sort of a marketing point about the fact that this is a solution that is as easy to uninstall as it's designed to be easy to install. Yeah, Nerdio's really found their niche in these uh, Azure deployment and uh, t tools that really just make, make deploying and uh, managing things on Azure just dramatically easier. Um, so th you said that this is designed for mid and large organizations because it kind of rolls, uh, if, I, if I was understanding right, it's, if these are, this is for customers who already have Azure infrastructure and they want to add WVD to it, right? Yeah, so, so that would be the, the ideal way to describe the target audience. It, it's a customer who already has a, an Azure infrastructure environment and just wants to add WVD to it. So that could be a small business, it could be a large business. The, um, the emphasis on midsize and larger is just that in Nerdio's experience, those tend to be the companies that have uh, Azure resources that they wanna reuse this way, um, you know, that have uh, an IT department and maybe they're more concerned about that multi-tenant management scenario and so on. So they're, they're assuming that the, the uptake for this product will be heaviest among midsize businesses and larger, but it's appropriate to anybody who, uh, who already has some Azure in place and wants to add. Is this, a, is this a different tool than kind of some of their current deployment and management options? Or is, so is it completely different or is it just kind of like a new feature of their existing offering? It is a completely different product. And in fact, they built it um, from scratch. One of the questions I had from them was, you know, did you take the uh, Nerdio for Azure product, which is like the kind of flagship, let's stand up some Azure in your business product. Did you take that and ad uh, adapt it, you know, pull some features out, add some features and turn it into Nerdio manager for WVD and um, they said no, they really felt like this was a specific enough and different enough use case that um, they actually created this from uh, the ground up. Interesting. Now, Bob, you've been, you've been around for quite a while. Have you played around with a lot of the virtual desktop solutions in the past or, or WVD specifically? Where do you see this going in the next five years? You know, it's, I've been accused of not being on the leading edge of things, but actually being on the bleeding edge of things because I'm always forward looking to where we're headed. We know where we are, we know where we've been. I've had an interest in virtual desktops for at least a dozen years. When the first concept came out, I thought, this could be huge. 
Virtual desktops haven't really gained a lot of traction in the SMB space, but to what Rich said earlier, now that we've got people accustomed to Office 365 and maybe you know um, Microsoft 365, I think with the whole movement toward metered computing, utility computing, virtual desktops have a bright future ahead of them. In the current environment right now with the uh, COVID-19 virus, you can see the benefit of somebody being able to get wherever they are to the desktop that they need to use in order to do their work. Uh, so I, I think there's a huge future in it. I haven't uh, actually played with it yet myself with the new version from Microsoft. Would like to do so, but I do think that there's going to be a lot of a lot of good benefits coming to small businesses when they use virtual desktops for computing, uh, especially when they're in an environment where mobility is part of what they do. So take, for example, real estate agents. They're always moving around. As long as they have some kind of internet connectivity on their tablet, they could reach their actual desktop, connect them back to the tools that they would use for creating a listing or signing up an addendum to an existing contract or whatever it might be. So you just multiply that one opportunity times any number of industries that have mobility as a aspect of how they operate and you see it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, we talked a, a lot at the last show with people uh, at the cocktail party and you know, there was a lot of discussions around how a scare like this specifically what is going to entice a lot of employees and a lot of companies to start saying, hey, maybe we don't have to all be in the same place. Maybe we can let you work from home. And you're absolutely right. Virtual desktop certainly facilitates that because on top of letting people work from home, I've also seen many of warnings uh, uh, in, in some of the channels that I follow and uh, prominent people in the industry saying, hey, be careful letting your employees go work from home because you need to make sure that they can do so in a secure way. Right. It's managed and, and um, follows the, the right policies and protocols. And they're not just left to the wind to use whatever they want and any tools they want and any consumer online services to facilitate their work. WVD practically solves that because their their computers follows them wherever they go. Right. That is right. A good example too of the impact of remote computing is that uh, the real estate market. You can go to almost any city and see lots of office space available for for lease. And one of the reasons is that many companies, large and small, now no longer require, as you say, to have everybody in that one big bullpen together. They can work from wherever they need to. Um, I know that a lot of companies have already done this. A good example was uh, the channel company. They have decentralized and not required everybody to be in the same physical location all the time. I was on their advisory board for their exchange events for quite a few years, and that was one of the transitions that they made during that time. It makes sense. Now, can it, can it apply to everybody? No, because sometimes you need that social interaction between yourself and your peers and your management um, because working remotely doesn't give you the ability sometimes to uh, get the nuances of how somebody says something in a phone conversation. You don't necessarily get to see their body language because you don't have a, a, a visual communication with them perhaps. So it, again, we go back to hybrid. Sometimes you can do things virtually, but maybe periodically you have to do it the old fashioned way where people get together face to face. But the option is there, as you say now, to use a controlled virtual environment to enforce uh, security and other policies and protect the corporate resources in a way that we couldn't do easily before. Maybe in this new future that we're going into, I definitely can see that if we have more scares like this and everybody is just panicked to leave their house, there's going to be a huge boon for robotics and virtual reality. So like you could maybe put a helmet on and then you can send this robot to the office and all of the robots interact. And like you have a, your face on the screen and all of the robots are talking to each other. It's like for you. So we can facilitate the, the interaction just with um, uh, giant segues that roll around with, with your picture on them. I remind you of the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. What happens if the robots can't get in because nobody wants to open the front door? 
Well, that's a that's a problem for IoT to solve. You know? <laughs> that's it. Push it off to the other guy. <laughs> Make the IoT people figure that out. They got physical security and door locks and all the, all that automation down. Yeah, they can even manage the robots themselves. We just need to be able to remote into them. Remember, and... Dave took out Hal. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's a good point. Yes. But everybody's gonna be at home on their couch because uh, they're gonna be too afraid to go outside. <laughs> Rich, are you, are you seeing a running theme here in the, in the show? Okay. <laughs> right. yeah, you know, I, I will quickly toss in, though, um, I, I'm already hearing from MSPs that they're getting uh, tons of inquiries from clients about remote work and remote work options, and um, not as, as often as probably should be the case, in inquiries about remote security, but um, the MSPs are getting worried about that. So I, I think the entire industry actually is about to get a crash course in, uh, in some of these you know, um, scaling virtual work. Um, uh, it, it's going to be a bigger uh, issue, something that uh, a lot more SMBs are going to be asking about, and uh, MSPs who maybe haven't been doing a ton of it for their customers are going to have to think about that a little bit. Uh, especially if this sticks around. Um, okay. it, it is absolutely going to be, be a big question on a lot of businesses' mind and a lot of rapid change, you know, in the way a lot of companies do business. So absolutely. Very, very true. All right, Rich, we're going to go and we're going to talk about pandas next. Because here on Channel 4 Weekly, we love our zoo animals. And, oh, wait, no, this is panda security. Never mind. Uh, but they, their mascot is a panda. And they're, it's yeah. fluffy and cuddly. But I should say it was a panda because, yet again, another company has been swallowed up uh, by another one. This is, you know, the big fish eating the little fish. Rich, who, who took panda and is going to get rid of their cool mascot? Uh, WatchGuard did, and and please don't blame WatchGuard if you, if you were for a moment there anticipating uh, adorable video of panda bears eating bamboo and so on, and now <laughs> we're just talking about security. Uh, it's not WatchGuard's fault. I, actually, this is I, we won't spend a ton of time on this because, like you say, it's it's kind of another acquisition in the industry, but it is sort of a sign of the times. It's it's interesting with respect to WatchGuard specifically. Um, and just also sort of uh, an indicator of, of uh, where the security industry is going right now. So WatchGuard is still, I think, for most people, um, you know, typically associated with firewalls. And that, that is the product that kind of made WatchGuard, WatchGuard is, is their whole firewall line. But um, as they saw the rise of cloud computing and mobile computing and, and um, the sort of post-perimeter IT landscape, they understood that if you're really just doing firewalls, um, there's a limited future in that market, and you're also maybe not doing um, you know, your uh, customers any favors because a firewall isn't going to protect them um, when they're out and about uh, with a smartphone or a tablet, working from home, working from Starbucks, et cetera. So they have been um, expanding what they do pretty steadily over the course of the last few years, and in particular, um, uh, sort of latish uh, last year, I guess last autumn, they introduced a, a product called uh, passport that they call a user-centric security solution. Um, it's got MFA and some other tools that you know follow the user wherever the user goes. It's not a matter of uh, keeping people safe behind the uh, the perimeter. Um, so they've you know really been evolving their portfolio. They they've revamped their partner program to reflect that. They're kind of changing with the times, and now they've taken a pretty significant further step in that direction. They acquired Panda Security. Um, which is a company that specializes in endpoint security, email security. Um, so, you know, WatchGuard is going to have a, um, a pretty wide uh, selection of security products now. You know, it's, they're well beyond um, firewalls and uh, that selection of uh, user-centric services now. They can really kind of, once this uh, acquisition is fully integrated and they've gone further down the road to integrating the products all together, they're really going to have an interesting um, uh, kind of expansive set of security technologies that they can bring to uh, to customers. And so, again, interesting story for anyone who follows WatchGuard, also kind of representative story of where security is going as the perimeter becomes less relevant in a lot of cases. And uh, companies that were, you know, perimeter focused have to figure out what's next. Yeah, we, we I would say we definitely saw the writing on the wall on this one, Rich. Primarily because if you're going to think of a bear that is going to protect you, right? I don't know if cuddly pandas are the first thing that come to mind. Like, why, did, why wasn't it like a grizzly bear security? Like, grizzly, like white or, you know, uh, North, uh, North Antarctic 
polar bear security. The big, <laughs> big bears, strong bears. Polar bear. Pol- polar bear. They are the worst of the worst. They make grizzlies look tame. <laughs> polar security. See, now, anyone looking to start a security company? Choose a ba- If you're going to choose a bear as a mascot, you got to choose a bear that's got strength, that is that says protection, tough. But, but, so, but is that what you would choose, the, the polar bear? I'm going to go with polar bear. Polar bear? Yeah, I agree. I, I think polar bear are like, um, I, I, think, I, I still think grizzlies are pretty big. I, I think those would, those right. would say it's security. They're pretty nasty, but I don't know. I think polar bears are even nasty because they live in the cold all the time. They don't get a real summer, right? It's true. They don't rich. Go on vacation your- to the Catskills, sunbathe <laughs> a little bit in Florida. They don't get any of that. So, yeah, that's why they're so nasty. It is. Rich, I don't know a lot about bears. Um, what, what bear would you choose? Well, you know, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, I, I, lesson learned, I, I finally figured out what went wrong. You know, years ago, I created a security company, and I told people it's it, tough products for tough situations, and it was called Cuddly Bear Security, and uh, it went nowhere. Now I understand why. Yeah, Teddy. Yeah, Teddy Bear Security, Cuddly Bear, Panda Bears, Puppy Dog Security. No, it's just not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> could, oh, the cute little dogs. Yeah. So, oh, Bob. So, what do you think of? Um, uh, we, uh, that's necessarily a, a, the WatchGuard Panda acquisition because this is just another company swallowing up another one. But, but as Rich pointed out, we are seeing uh, this new holistic approach to security. So, we're seeing a lot of these companies that had a niche in one area, like firewalls, kind of working to, to acquire or build out portfolios that are far more comprehensive. What do you think about that trend? I think I was ahead of that, uh, that curve a long time ago because I hitched my start at Fortinet years ago. And uh, their offerings for their uh, firewall routers with unified threat management was the thing that really attracted me for my clientele. Yes, they were more expensive than a sonic wall device in the old days or uh, some of the other... I guess you would call them more consumer-oriented type firewalls, but it's one thing to have that little device at the edge. It's another thing to be able to monitor the flow through it and prevent stuff from getting to the endpoints because you have the right set of software and services. So um, I, I felt that that was the right way to go years ago, and it's proving to be the case now. I know that a lot of people have been uh, very happy with WatchGuard, as a firewall device, um, but you know, seeing them taking the next step to incorporate more protection and more services is obviously the right move in today's computing environment where we are always under threat of being hacked, of being uh, subjected to ransomware. And oftentimes the big key with ransomware is the person that sits between the keyboard and the chair, right? So no firewall device is going to be able to control somebody's hand clicking on that link and looking for the coronavirus map that's now infected. I don't, are you guys familiar with that one this morning? No, no. What happened with that? Um, uh, uh, Rob Ray from Datto uh, posted in one of the Facebook groups that there is a new virus, a coronavirus map virus, that is taking people to phony coronavirus maps and doing a pretty sophisticated injection, a two-step process that's uh, causing all kinds of havoc. And obviously, he suggested that if you want to see the coronavirus map, go to the John Hopkins website only, where it's the legitimate site. So again, that kind of social engineering in a situation like this popped up very, very quickly. The bad actors, they, they don't sleep. They spend every hour of every day trying to figure out how to get what they want out of somebody else. And so that's where the, the robustness of, of that router firewall combination becomes more and more important. Unified threat management, try to get on it, update it quickly and easily, make sure that your clientele is protected to the greatest extent possible. And then you're at the mercy of the stupidity of your employees from that point forward. And you know, I, I think that's, you just hit on the, the exact point. It's because if, you're, if I was a firewall company, I would be sitting here realizing that network intrusion is generally not how hacks like this occur. It is human error. It is the phishing attempts, the ransomware. So I can build, I can build a massive wall 
in front of a, in front of a corporate network. But when you have an employee that opens the door, it doesn't make a difference, right? That's right. So I, if I was a firewall company, I'd be like, you know what? I have to move beyond, beyond building the wall. I need to say, hey, I will build a wall and we will protect you from that kind of stuff. But we also have to, but we can also now protect you from when something like that happens. So we are going to monitor the endpoints. We're going to monitor the emails because that is also just as likely, if not more likely, how companies are going to be, be uh, it would, be almost, it would be almost the ideal solution to have the employees operate in a sandbox that has to be vetted before it goes from the sandbox out of bound. Uh, you that, know what? Sandboxing employees is probably one of the next steps, right? And I, that, I bet things like it. virtual desktops can facilitate that pretty exactly. easily. I mean, sandboxing is not a new con concept, but if we can sandbox the employees and just prevent that command from going out or executing, long enough for us to recognize that there's something wrong there, we have half a chance of defeating the bad actors. And employees would probably like being in a sandbox because you can have your little pail and you can build castles and... I, I have three cats and they swear by it. <laughs> well, they're doing something else in that sandbox, not just, uh, not hey, just hey. playing or working. Hey, hey, don't judge. <laughs> Unless you put in the sandbox, you shouldn't judge. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's going to quickly derail into, uh, into territory. We don't want to go down. So instead we are going to switch to our next story, uh, which is an, another security kind of related story, more, be more protection. Uh, but this is, this is an, a, a new thing that people need to protect. So we, we can, we, we always talk about backing up the endpoints, protecting the endpoints so you can restore. But now the trend is rich. Tell me if I'm wrong is compromising the backups because everybody, all these hackers know that backup is now becoming a thing and they're, everyone's backing their stuff up. So if you're, gonna, if you're gonna hit them with a ransomware attack, they can't have something to roll back to. Otherwise, there's no, you're not gonna get anything. So you gotta compromise the backups and then, and then go after them so that way they're, they're hosed. So there's a new protection for that. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. So, I mean, how many times have security companies uh, or BDR companies said that backups are the last line of defense in a complete layered security strategy, the last line of defense against ransomware? Well, turns out the bad guys are listening too. And so, yeah, as, you know, ransomware attacks these days very specifically um, hunt down, go after backups, and they'll, uh, you know, uh, corrupt that file, delete that file, modify that file, encrypt that file if they can. Um, so this story we we're talking about here um, concerns Axiant uh, and a technology that they have added to their X360 platform. This actually, um, they, they went public with this news a uh, week before last um, when, or uh, uh, last week, excuse me, when we were in Dallas. But this uh, technology has been a part of the X360 platform for about four months now. Um, they didn't really want to publicize it at first. Um, and they're, they're still, I think, a little bit weary about publicizing it because they don't want to... Uh, attract too much attention from somebody who might try to figure out how to defeat it. But it's, uh, it's essentially a, a, a technology called AirGap that they've added to their um, backup, X3, X360 backup platform that is des um, designed to protect backups from these targeted attacks from um, ransomware uh, viruses. So uh, it, it uses a number of different techniques um, to protect the backup, um, you know, first and foremost, um, they have added some um, verification steps in the process. So if a, uh, an end user wants to delete a backup, modify a backup, et cetera, it's not so easy to just go ahead and do it now. There are some um, fail-safe steps in there that you have to go through to um, you know, persuade Axiant that this is a legitimate request. But the um, other big thing that they're doing that's really kind of interesting is they have created, and here's where the air gap name comes from, they've created this... Um, segregated network environment where they are essentially storing backups of backups. And they're not really talking about how long they retain those backups of backups, but for some period of time, um, after you modify a backup, they've got a, a, a version of the file before that change happened. And what this means, of course, is if one of your customers is um, you know, successfully struck by, by ransomware and their backup is corrupted or encrypted, you can go to Axiant and for some win window of time, I don't know exactly how long, they can actually give you a, uh, a clean version of that backup and get you back to where you, uh, that customer was before. 
Um, so, you know, again, kind of a sign of the times, uh, right, that you, you've got to implement these kinds of uh, uh, stringent protections um, here, even just to protect the, uh, the backups from, uh, from ransomware. But it is, it's a very interesting uh, technology. I haven't heard anything, heard of anything quite like it from anybody else here. And like I said, it's been up and running for four months at this point. Apparently, it has already um, saved the bacon of multiple MSPs who work with Axiom, uh, who had a customer struck by ransomware. They thought, you know, it's just we're out of luck, and they discovered that they could actually get a clean backup um, from this uh, air gap system. Now, there's another feature in here that I, I want to point out that is really interesting, and because one of the things that is important about security and protection is knowing when you're being attacked. <laughs> so um, they included some kind of honeypot feature in here that like puts co backup copies out there in a place where they want hackers to attack them because if they're compromised, then you know it. So, did, you, did they talk about that at all? Because I, I see that mentioned in here. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they uh, you know, that is one of the, uh, of the ways that they're trying to protect uh, backups from ransomware. One of the techniques built into Airgap is, yeah, there, there is a honeypot component uh, to the solution, essentially, where they're, uh, they're waiting for attacks to happen um, and expose themselves, basically, which is, you know, a way, it gives them an opportunity to uh, alert an MSP and, uh, uh, and, uh, keep an attack potentially against, uh, you know, real production backups. Very cool. Now, Bob, I have a business proposition for you. Okay. Next, new business model, right? Because we have the backups of the backups. I propose, Bob, you and I, new, yes. new security company, backups of the backups of the backups. That's kind of like the, the, uh, the enemy of my, the friend of my enemy is my friend or whatever it was, what is that saying? Right, but this is now the friend of my enemy is my friend of my enemy's former roommate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I read this article, I, I thought it was a great idea. I love it because in the MSP world, um, there is no air gap with the backup device on site if the end user doesn't take that tape or drive or whatever that media is out of the machine and put it somewhere secure so that it's not connected to the internet and nobody can get to it overnight and compromise it. The, uh, I, I've always thought from an MSP standpoint, one of the things that should keep you up at night and make you not sleep very well is the potential liability you have as a practitioner for the advice you're giving your clients on how to have protected backups that can function properly on Restore to get you out of a ransomware situation. I don't think all of the liability insurance in the world is enough to protect you if you screw up somebody's business and they go out of business. So anything that we can do with our partners in the, in the channel to bring resources to bear that are affordable, that make sense, and that are relatively foolproof way of combating all these bad actors uh, that's a win-win for everybody in my book, but it's a, it's a huge liability. That's got um, Rich's tongue. Apparently, I was waiting for him to respond because it looked like you wanted to say something. <laughs> <laughs> and what you no, what, Bob, what you said was was is very profound. That's absolutely correct. the The liability here is is huge, especially uh, this day and age where where humans are the, as we were just talking about, humans are the weak link and you have to provide the right advice to protect them, these companies from their own employees, but also protect, protect the business from, from compromise. Like even if you just back up, right? Backing up, as you say, is not enough anymore. You have to be able to separate that backup from the company. Right? Of course, one of the things that people don't even think about is we have all these backups, but are they any good? Backup is no good unless you do test restores. You always need to do periodic test restores to make sure your backup processes are working correctly. I had only one client that got a ransomware infection, and uh, when she called me up and told me about these crazy file names that she couldn't decipher, she was trying to do some things, I knew right away she had gotten infected. So uh, I remoted into her system and got enough information that I could determine which ransomware it was, 
uh, found that there was no effective way to combat it. So I said, don't worry, I'll be there shortly. We'll fix it. Uh, went and grabbed a new hard drive at Fry's on the way out of town, got there, turned off your system, put a new hard drive in there, reconnected it to the Windows Essential server, which was doing the backups. This was on a Monday morning, so we did a Friday night restore, and then we reconnected her to her Office 365 account for her email and everything. The whole process took like one hour, she was back in business. The reason it didn't affect the rest of that particular network of three users was because they weren't sharing on the network any file shares. They were using their property management software and its features hosted exclusively, so there was no harm, no foul, but that's not necessarily the case. Most businesses are going to have files that they're going to be sharing amongst people in that local network. All of those systems could have gotten compromised, but because there were no shares to go after, it literally did not know what to do in that particular environment. Um, but that was eye-opening for me, not because we were able to get her restored quickly, but it's like, holy cow, I can't control what my clients do. And these are people that are very, very cautious, but all it takes is one piece of well-engineered um, social networking type of software or an email message or anything else, and boom, you could be toast. Um, I still think that in the SMB space, this is one of the biggest risks, finding out how to do proper backups that are air-gapped, and I love that term, and make sure that, that it's affordable. I mean, that's the whole thing. Most small business will roll the dice because of cost, and you ask them, what is your business worth to you? And they don't really value it the way it should be valued until they have a catastrophe that puts them out of business, and then the litigation starts. So that's the thing that kept me up at night, and I gotta tell you, I sleep eight hours a day now very well. Yeah. Now, I, I think that's, you know, that's a really kind of critical point, is when we talk about a technology, when we talk about BDR, when we talk about a technology like AirGap, you know, first and foremost, these are security protections for the end user. Um, but it really is critical. I, I think you're absolutely right to think of these as well as protections for the MSP, um, because if, uh, you know, whether it's your fault or not, if, uh, if your end user has some sort of catastrophic incident like this, uh, you're absolutely right that, you know, there, there's not enough insurance in the world uh, basically to avoid what's probably headed your way. So, um, yeah, this, this makes everybody in, uh, in the in environment, everybody in this transaction safer because, um, you know, and, and the, it's like the, the least harmful case um, if a customer gets struck by ransomware like that is you're going to get fired and lose that client. Um, and it could get a lot more expensive than that. So, yeah, just, just from a, a sheer self-preservation standpoint, um, you know, it's a wise idea to be investigating these kinds of tools. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we are going to go on to other types of tools that, uh, that we're going to talk about. So we're kind of done with the news, but... We've got a couple other stories that are they're really interesting. We want to talk about um, one is uh, about Kaseya, and we we just had uh, someone from Kaseya on not all that long ago. Rich, isn't that, that correct? Uh, that is. We had uh, Jim Lippy from Kaseya on just within the uh, the last episode or two. Yeah, yeah, it was it was the last episode. That's right. Yeah. Uh, the 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 channel for channel for forum break kind of threw me off a little bit, right? But yeah, yeah. it was episode uh, one hundred and thirty six. Go check that out with uh, with Jim Lippy because it's a really great interview, and you get to see a lot of like how Kaseya thinks and what they're doing and how uh, they're, they're reacting in that market, uh, marketplace. But they are heavily investing in what, what is called IT Complete. And they want that to be a name to be reckoned with. And that's kind of what the story is about. Rich, tell us about it. Yeah, so this is actually uh, based on an interview I did with Matt Solomon from Kaseya at our show in Dallas last week. Um, because one of our big sponsors at that show was uh, labeled as Kaseya IT Complete. And you know we're familiar with the Kaseya name. Um, we're familiar with a lot of the companies that Kaseya has acquired in recent years because, you know, of the big managed services suite makers, they've probably been most aggressive in terms of their merger and acquisition strategy. They've, they've acquired um, Unitrends and BDR, Spanning, which is cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup, Rapid-Fire Tools, which uh, a lot of folks know about, um, IT Glue, ID Agent, the dark web monitoring folks. So they've really acquired a whole bunch of different companies, and, um, you know, they, they've been emphatic 
uh, from the beginning that all of those um, acquisitions will continue to do business under their original name um, as subsidiaries, as business units, basically, of Kaseya, and that remains true today. But um, it was interesting to me um, to see something called Kaseya IT Complete, um, you know, identify itself as a sponsor at our conference, and ours is not the only one that um, Kaseya IT Complete is participating in. Now, that the IT Complete name is not new. That is the name that um, Kaseya has been assigning to its integrated suite of products, including products from all those companies before. What's new is that beginning this year, they've really kind of embarked on a concerted campaign to build awareness of that name and more importantly, build awareness of the integrated suite. Um, so there's no change of direction in terms of companies like IT Glue and ID Agent and Rapid Fire Tools continuing to be um, separate business uh, units that do business under those names, but the Kaseo folks are really trying to build awareness of the advantages to MSPs from their perspective of using all these products together within IT Complete. And one of the things Matt, you know, uh, Matt Solomon told me in this interview is it's surprising to him how often he runs into MSPs who didn't even know that Kaseya owns ID Agent or, or Unitrends or one of these companies. So they've got efforts underway to change that. Um, in connection with that, um, they are also starting to roll together um, partner programs and business development programs that uh, in the past were independently operated by a lot of these different uh, Kaseya business units. Um, and I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing. So Matt Solomon used to be uh, an executive with ID Agent. Um, uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Dan Tomaszewski, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, I think I am, another um, a former MSP actually, but also a former executive ID, ID Agent, they've both been put into really prominent roles um, in this IT complete and partner program business development um, roll up kind of strategy because it turns out that one of the things to say about valued about ID agent when they bought that uh, company was how smart ID agent was about the way that they worked with partners and so now what they're trying to do is take some programs that ID agent has been making available to its partners for a long time and make them available across the board to all of Kaseya's uh, partners and First and foremost, that includes something from ID Agent originally called Goal Assist, um, which is a program that gives you access to a, a set number of hours. I think it's something like five hours a year of sales advice, go-to-market planning advice, and in some cases, actual um, uh, deal clo closing assistance, um, where somebody will get on the phone with you and, and help you uh, close the deal. It was something that was... Um, very popular among ID agent partners. They're rolling it out more broadly now um, to Kaseya partners uh, across the board. Similar kind of thing to um, the partner enablement program uh, that uh, Dan Tomaszewski was in charge of at ID agent. Um, you know, they, they create a very robust menu of um, training courses and brandable materials and uh, go to market resources that would really kind of help an MSP, um, you know, in the early days uh, develop a dark web monitoring or security related kind of business. Now they, they've got this big infusion of, of money available to them and they're rolling out similar kinds of resources for all the different products and business opportunities and, and that's all kind of going under this IT complete uh, umbrella. And then the, the last but um, far from least significant piece of the story here worth um, pointing out that I thought was really interesting is um, the, the key advantage to going with IT Complete as opposed to maybe mixing and matching um, some of these uh, products from the Kaseya uh, business units from Kaseya's standpoint is the integration among those, uh, those products. They have this concept that they talk a lot at Kaseya um, called workflow integrations, which I think of as being really deep sort of source code level integration as opposed to API level integration, which they at Kaseya will sort of dismiss as cosmetic uh, integration. Um, so they, they've been spending a lot of time on these workflow integrations among the Kaseya products. That's really, from their perspective, what makes IT Complete worth adopting. And one of the things Matt mentioned is that all of these different business units now are required to uh, dedicate 20% of their um, development budget in additional integrations among these different products. And he said that you know, this year that's like $14 million dollars that's going to get sunk into more integrations among the IT complete uh, components. So, um, you know, it, it clearly uh, we're in the early stages of a big, significant kind of push on the suite 
um, from Kaseya, you know, in addition to uh, the, the individual products. So would you, are they marketing IT Complete as like IT Complete by Kaseya and it includes all of those things or are they kind of issuing the individual brand names as this kind of new complete suite? Like how are they marketing it? Because this is kind of a marketing kind of article in, in general, but how, how are they pushing that this is different or comprehensive in, in that way? So, um, I mean, it's, it's like a both and kind of strategy. They're, they're perfectly happy for you to do business individually with rapid fire tools, say, or, or spanning. Um, but, um, you know, from, from their perspective, the, the more MSPs they get bought into IT complete, the, uh, uh, the more deeply embedded they are within those, uh, accounts. So they're also, um, trying to get people interested in this whole kind of suite concept and they understand you know they're, they're branding it complete as a suite they understand that msps don't typically um write a check and buy an entire suite so they see this as a gradual process where you might come in to it complete via the id agent product and then they'll kind of show you the advantages of adopting more pieces uh, of the suite but they want people to be aware of the fact that the suite is there and they want to spend more time um, uh, kind of evangelizing what, what they see as the advantages of using, you know, several or all of uh, those products together. Bob, which, which way do you see as, do uh, you think this is going to be more advantageous? Is it, do you think MSPs are going to flock to IT Complete as a, as a more comprehensive suite? Or do you think they're so like to pick and choose their tools? You know, this brings up an interesting thing that I pointed out as the merger and acquisition uh, frenzy amongst um, providers of tools in the industry has gained a lot of uh, momentum. Uh, for example, um, one of your favorite tools might be acquired by, say, ConnectWise. But if you're a Kaseya guy and you can no longer have access to the tool that, Kaseya, that ConnectWise acquired, um, what do you do? Well, in this case, Kaseya is saying, if you're a rapid fire tools guy, you can still use rapid fire tools. You don't have to buy into the whole Kaseya thing. Uh, same thing with IDH and so forth. I think that's a smart move on their part. I don't know that other companies have um, been as willing to let those users of those standalone tools still maintain that autonomous relationship that they've enjoyed with that tool when they've been acquired by another company. So I think that's a good idea. But uh, quite honestly, I think that anybody that puts together this uh, overarching suite of anything runs the risk of alienating some people because they don't necessarily find that the best of class tool is the one that that company acquired. Now obviously everybody that acquires a tool think they got the best tool and the best price and the best deal and everything else. But when consolidation occurs and people are maybe forced to buy a suite, it's going to affect the way people see whether or not they want to do business with that company. So giving them at least the option of still maintaining an autonomous relationship with rapid fire tools, ID agent, you name it, is, is a smart move in the, in the, in the short term. If they can earn somebody's business by showing that that suite of tools is to the best interest of that MSP, then they've done their job. But it's a, it's a tougher sell, I think, when you consolidate things and say it's all or none. I think we've all grown up in the industry over 20, 30 years uh, using tools that were once very effective and then they either got absorbed by somebody, they disappeared, they're gone. I mean, think about... Um, PC tools way many years ago it was a great suite of tools and then it got absorbed by, uh, I believe it was Norton, and then eventually it kind of just poof, disappeared. Uh, so those people that had tools within PC tools that they enjoyed had to find other things to replace it with. It's, uh, it's either that or you just go with the flow and take whatever comes your way because you don't have a choice. So choice is always good. I think the opportunity to let people make their decisions based on performance and what you have to offer, not only as the new owner of a tool, but also as somebody that is saying, we have a vision, we think we can take your business further, give us a shot, take a look at what we have and make your own decision. It's, it's about the best you can do. 
And, and I think that's exactly what uh, what they're thinking at Kaseya. And I, you know, I, I think there are other vendors who uh, sort of understand this as well. That you know, if 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 any of these uh, sweet makers was to go out and um, impose, you know, buying the entire suite on MSPs and just sort of not um, uh, give people the ability to combine tools from different vendors and so on. I mean, that, that would be a huge mistake. It would be enormously um, resented uh, among MSPs. So I think that the strategy here um, this year around IT Complete is exactly what you're talking about. It, you know, first and foremost, make people aware that the suite exists and what's in it. Um, and then inspire them um, to get more interested in, in um, embracing more of that suite. Um, so give people the choice to do what they're going to do, um, but try to motivate them to do what, what you want them to do, which ultimately, if you're Kaseya, is to, to really kind of standardize on the entire IT Complete suite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. All right. How much are we getting paid to give all this wonderful consultation to Kaseya? <laughs> I mean, we're quite operated businesses, aren't we? Should we be getting something out of this from them? All this wisdom? We will we will inform Kaseya that the, the bill is in the mail. Good. And uh we'll 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 see what we get back, but uh, I'm not gonna hold my breath. <laughs> Probably three certificates for large lunches that drive up windows. <laughs> yes, indeed. Indeed. One Big Mac for me, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, security vendors, um, which we, we were talking a lot about security vendors these days. Well, they I MSSPs. So for those who are not familiar with that acronym, uh, it is the managed security services provider. They see them as the, uh, the key route to landing MSPs. Rich, this is a lot of acronyms flying around in this title here. So they want MSSPs to land MSPs because MSPs are not MSSPs but they have the PCBs of the MSS CPDs to work with PDs and FDs, right? And you have a story perfectly, Matt. Uh, there's almost nothing further to say, but and I- And we're moving on, baby. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the last episode we did, um, I was like a day or two away from having attended the RSA security conference. And I think we actually mentioned on the show, you know, we we'd had talked a little bit about some news that came out of the show, but there was more to come. and. Um, so this is one of those things that um, that uh, I wrote about after we did that last episode. And it's not a huge thing, but it, it is, um, I think, sort of worth mentioning. It was one of the um, uh, sort of newsworthy little observations that I made at the RSA show uh, this year, which is that a lot of the security vendors I met with had um, very specific programs in place, strategies in place, um, initiatives in place to target MSSPs. Um, and so, you know, it, you will hear that acronym actually a lot in the industry. You have heard it a lot in the industry in recent years, and it gets used in different ways by, um, by different people. Um, I, you know, I have for a while now at least um, contended that if, if you can truly call yourself a managed uh, security service provider, it means that um, you are, uh, if not doing security exclusively, you're doing it in a really, really serious and frankly expensive kind of way. If you have a security operations center, if you've got high price security analysts on staff, if you're doing you know 24 seven log analysis and so on, you can legitimately call yourself an MSSP. Um, if you're you know a managed service provider who has some kind of security offering, even if it's an advanced security offering, you're doing managed security, but you're not really in, in you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're not technically an MSSP and the security vendors appreciate or, or I guess um, have adopted that same distinction because from their standpoint, companies that fit into that um, or, or meet that set of criteria that I just described, they've got a SOC, they've got analysts, they're really serious about security. There aren't a ton of those um, out on the marketplace right now. You, you know, there, there are thousands and thousands of MSPs, you know, dozens and dozens of MSSPs. And so what a lot of these companies are doing right now is saying, you know what, it's going to be a lot easier to go after the MSSPs and then essentially turn the MSSPs into a distribution arm for us. So this quite explicitly is what SonicWall, for example, has decided to do. Um, last year, they came out with a product, a management uh, interface that is specifically for MSSPs and is part of a program on their part that will include, you know, a partner program and, and all sorts of other incentives to get MSSPs bought into doing business with SonicWall and then offering SonicWall-based security services to MSPs on an outsourced basis. 
And you know, we've been talking a lot about our um, our conference events uh, this year, and the one that we just did in Dallas. We've got an entire session about managed security. And one of the messages that um, came up loud and clear uh, last week in that conversation was, um, you should, if you're an MSP, you should absolutely be looking at creating a managed security offering that goes, you know, beyond the firewall, antivirus kind of stuff, and gets you into a much wider, deeper um, array of security technologies. But um, unless you've got a SOC, unless you can uh, call yourself an MSSP, you're almost certainly going to have to partner with somebody else, a third party who can fill in um, the, the gaps in your services that you really just can't deliver on your own. That's what these MSSPs do. That's what the vendors are figuring out. And, uh, and it has a lot of vendors now um, getting serious about recruiting MSSPs and using them to go out and, and build an MSP channel. There's a lot of vendors that, that provide you know, SOC as a service. Are those the same as the MSSPs or are MSSPs providing other MSPs so like SOC services, or wouldn't they view them as competitors? I'm a little confused on how that's playing out. Yeah, so I mean, there are obviously lots of different kinds of security vendors. So um, you know, the name that just popped into my head when you were talking there is uh, Vigilant. Vigilant, I mean, what they do is, uh, or uh, Arctic Wolf is another great example, outsourced um, SOC services. Um, uh, Rocket Cyber uh, does that now. Um, so yeah, th th you can think of those guys as MSSPs. Um, that's not what SonicWall does, and it's not what they want to do. So that's why they're creating um, alliances with uh, with companies of that sort. Gotcha. Bob, what do you think? You know, it's interesting because Rich and I had a conversation earlier this week about this very subject. And from my perspective, smaller MSPs have um, a really dire need to partner with MSSPs because they can't recreate that wheel economically and they don't have the time to get caught up to speed. If you're a um, sole proprietor MSP or you have one or two employees, you don't have the resources to do this, but it's essential that you be providing the right kind of security to your clients. So, as we've said so many times, partnerships are a good thing. And if it's affordable both for the MSP and for their end client, I think that the wisest thing to do to again go back to the liability question, reduce your liability footprint and proactively show your clients that you are putting out best practices for them, you partner with a really high quality MSSP that's willing to provide those services in a way that it's affordable all the way downstream from them to the MSP to the end user. Um, it's a moving target. It's a target that moves with such speed today that small MSPs can't keep up with all the security problems and the solutions that keep the bad guys out. So again, are you going to undertake an, un an unlimited type of liability by not being able to be the top of the line MSSP yourself? Or are you gonna find a way to provide those services and be the rock star for your clients so that they know that you're doing everything you can possibly do to prevent them from being attacked. And even if they are attacked, you maybe will know it within milliseconds because somebody is monitoring those, uh, those uh, little switches that can switch and say, uh, danger Will Robinson, we see something going on in this particular uh, network or this particular desktop. I think that's the only solution for the small providers today. No, I, I, I completely agree. And like I said, I mean, the, the, this it was very much the consensus on stage at, uh, at our show uh, last week. Um, you know, it, 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 there is a huge uh, revenue opportunity and profit opportunity for MSPs in uh, advanced security, managed security right now. Um, it, those services are very much, they're badly in need um, by SMB end users. And so you, you may even be doing your clients a disservice by not offering them. But really, for mu the vast majority of MSPs, the only way you're going to be able to do that um, is going to be, you know, by allying yourself with, um, with somebody who has uh, capabilities you're just not, you know, that, that you just can't afford to uh, develop and cultivate uh, in-house and, um, you know, uh, Security operations centers are a, a classic example uh, of that. You you want the 
the best one you can get, and that's probably not going to be something that you threw together yourself. It's probably going to be something um, owned and operated by a company that does very little else. And uh, yeah, so partnering is a huge uh, component of the, the managed security story right now. A fellow that I became acquainted with through the exchange events many years ago, David Stelzel, um, wrote a book called The House in the Cloud. And it was designed to teach MSPs how to sell security, first and foremost, to your clients. Um, I don't know that every MSP has read his book, The House in the Cloud, but they really should. Because a lot of MSPs think, well, I can't impose that kind of cost onto a uh, a client, they're just not going to pay for that kind of service. But the way you sell the right kind of security is by getting your client to understand exactly what they have to lose in terms of dollars and cents if their business is so compromised that they lose the business. And that's the key. A lot of people don't really value their business until they don't have it any longer or until they're down for an hour a week, a month, whatever it is to restore their business to full operations. But all of those downtimes can be quantified in terms of cost. And when you put that out there in a very structured way to a client, then you can sell them the security that they actually need, not the security that they think they want. And that's the big thing because if you're just putting in a router with a firewall and endpoint security, you're not really doing security. And that's what you have to explain to people because that's not their business. They may be an auto dealership. They may be a real estate brokerage firm. Whatever is their business line, that's what they understand. But they also understand what it costs not to be in business. So if you can quantify that for them, you have an excellent chance of getting them on board with the right kind of security and you partner up with the person that's the pro and everybody's going to be happy. And it, it doesn't hurt um, in, in this context that uh, you're getting an assist from the media, um, basically, because there are plenty of stories about hacks uh, in the news right now. And that, too, uh, I think does increasingly get the, uh, the attention of a, an SMB business owner. You know, there are definitely a lot of people who uh, don't think it's going to happen to them and, and way, way too many SMBs out there who have little to no protection in place. That phenomenon, unfortunately, hasn't disappeared. But... Um, it, it's at least getting a little bit easier um, to convince uh, an SMB that they do need to, to make some investments in security because they can see what happens to other companies that don't. I always think that when you see a story in the news about a particular governmental entity, a city or a county or even a state that has been attacked through ransomware and they've had a tremendous cost and dis in disruption to their operations, that the average small business person or even a medium-sized office can see that if it can happen to somebody that has those kind of resources available to them, it can certainly happen to my business. And what can I do to prevent that from happening? Because, well, the city can always raise more taxes or charge more money for different fees. I can't do that. I have my business model. I can only do so much. So what do I do if my business goes in the toilet because of a fatal ransomware attack. So you're right, Rich, the, the media stories are supporting the MSP's ability to get that story out to the clients. That they are. And uh, this is certainly not the last time we're gonna talk about um, the need for you know uh, uh, advanced security operations and how you uh, go about getting that and offering those services to your customers. It's gonna be a long, long road as we all uh, traverse that path. But we are running a little short on time, so we're going to wrap it up here. Reminder to everybody who's been listening along or watching us here on YouTube, um, you can uh, open up the description area on YouTube, or if you're listening um, on, your, on your phone or your tablet, um, you can go to the show sheet for episode 137 at channelpronetwork.com, and there we list out all of the links to all the articles that we've been kind of talking about, because we, we scratched the surface here, and we kind of discussed them a little bit, but there's usually a lot more information and data in there for you to kind of digest and think about. So make sure you go and check those out and, and kind of read through the whole, the whole story and get all the extra information. We are going to take a short break. We don't have an interview uh, coming up. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to, when we come back, we're going, to, we're going to play a quick round of five questions with Bob Nitrios. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I do have a, a quick museum pick and a tech pick for you uh, that we will go through. And, of course, Rich will break down what, is, uh, what has, has been and what is to come in the week ahead. So stick around. We will be right back.
All right, and welcome back to Travel Weekly, episode 137 with our guest host, Bob Nitrio, where we are going to play our uh, famous game that we've kind of uh, done a few times here and everybody seems to love, Five Questions. What this is all about is we will ask Bob uh, five kind of, kind of completely random questions off the top of our head, and it could be about anything and everything, and we'll just see what he's got to say. Bob, are you ready? I am ready. All right, I will kick us off. Kind of an easy one. As a newcomer to Arizona, what would be your top tip for those looking to head to the Southwest? <laughs> I would have to say, beware of bad drivers. <laughs> I thought California had the worst drivers in the, in the country, but I was wrong. It's Arizona. I have seen more boneheaded moves on city as well as freeways. Uh, just uh, yeah, be, be very careful. Make sure you have lots of insurance. So brush up your insurance, <laughs> as I think the tip there uh, to come. Rich, fire off question two. So, uh, and I, I will preface this by saying it's kind of a trick question because I know the answer, but I think the answer is super interesting. Bob, have you ever played in a rock and roll band with a musician from an even more famous band? Yes, uh, it's funny that you should bring that up. Uh, in high school, I had rock bands, a couple of different iterations. Senior year, I needed a new drummer. So we picked this junior that was interested in working with us. Fabulous drummer. He went on to bigger and better things. His name is Mike Shreve. He was Santana's drummer, and he's been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We had a little um, incident uh, called a 50-year reunion coming up for our high school a while back, and we realized that a couple of our classmates would not be there because they would not be alive. So we put on our own, ginned up a 49th high school reunion. We got together about 12 of us who had bands, and we called Mike up in Seattle and said, hey, Mike. Would you like to come down and play for this? And he goes, oh, hell yes. <laughs> he came down. We did some Santana covers with him. And we did, with, with uh, three practice sessions, we did three one-hour sets and uh, had a great time. And we have it all on DVD. So maybe one day I'll show you at a conference. I, I must have this DVD. Bob? <laughs> I'm going to like ransom you for it or something. I got to get a copy of this. That sounds <laughs> amazing. What a cool story. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mike's an amazing guy. He's a really great guy. And uh, we, we uh, were very fortunate in the high school that we went to. It was an all boys Catholic high school and it was very, everybody was very close. So uh, those relationships uh, still exist today and keep in touch with each other. And it's a fun thing. That is very cool. I don't know about your high school, Rich. I, I can only think of about, Two people from my high school that I have any interest in talking to ever again in my life. <laughs> and none of them are like the drummer for Santana. Maybe that would hurt my interest okay. more. Yeah, and none of them probably played at Woodstock. Uh, nope, nope. None of them did there either. Uh, that was one of the them, iconic drum solo of all times. <laughs> I think one of them set an all-time record for New York parking tickets, if I remember correctly. But I Something to that effect. But I don't know if that's a very good reason to want to reconnect and reminisce of the old days. All right, Mike, next question. We, we touched on a, a, little, a little bit about breakfast cereals. So, Bob, I have to ask, what are your top three favorite breakfast cereals? Um, oatmeal, oatmeal, and oatmeal. Ah, he's an oatmeal. All right, so... so my doctor it, said I should eat oatmeal. <laughs> so, so, all right, so let me rephrase this question a little bit because I was hoping, like, you know, like corn puffs or whatever. So, top three flavors or top three ingredients, like add-ins to your oatmeal? Oh, blueberries, strawberries, and pecans, mm. and brown sugar. Uh, naturally. Yes. It's not oatmeal if it doesn't have brown yeah. sugar. I used to like honey nut oats. I used to like shredded wheat. I used to like um, a few others, but my doctor says, stick with the oatmeal, you'll live to be 132. So I'm just a little over halfway there. I'm looking to get there. I would also, just to kind of rehash that, I would also definitely look at investing into robotics companies for when you get that old. So we can just kind of plop your head on, a, on something that rolls around. Because, you know, 132, that's pretty old. Well, you know, if we could do something like Cleopatra where they carried her on that, on that couch, <laughs> I could go with that. that. That would be good. I love it. Rich, question number four to you. 
Uh, so, Bob, you, you live out uh, in, in the desert there, a, a uh, sun and fun kind of destination for folks. Golf, tennis, or neither of the above? Uh, neither of the above. Actually, I'm a, uh, I'm a competitive bowler, and I have yet to get back into competitive bowling here in, uh, in the Phoenix area, but I intend to. Uh, golf is a little bit tough here in the summertime. Uh, usually you have to do it early in the morning and you have to wear a headlight, you know, so you can see where the golf ball's going because you have to get up at three to play golf in the summertime here. Um, bowling, you know, you can do any time of the year. It's an indoor sport. It's air conditioned. Who cares? It's a good thing. Tennis, same problems as, you know, golf. But the swimming in the backyard pool, that's kind of any time. It's okay. So that, what's your what's your average, if if you don't mind me asking? Um, when I was bowling regularly, I was pushing two hundred. Good for you. Good for you. I'm I'm also a uh, former bowler. I, I wouldn't say competitive bowler. I did a league for quite a long time. Uh, so Bob, the next time we get together, you and I are going bowling. I'm all in. I am yeah. all in. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. My average a little a little. I got a, a little bit on the average when I was when I was doing it regularly. My average was in the high two twenties. Uh huh. Uh, what was the highest game you ever got? Uh, 284. Good for, good for you. I'm actually one pin behind you. 283 was my highest game. Yeah. So uh, I, did, cool. I did, I did roll an Italian 300 one time though. An Italian 300? I don't know that expression. What does that mean? Well, I rolled seven strikes to finish one game and five strikes to roll uh, to do the next one. So that was the 12 I needed. And so it spanned two games, but it's an Italian 300. I would take it anyway. Yes. We, gloat, we, gloat away, we, sir. Anytime you can get 13 in a row, that is, uh, that is damn good. All right. Uh, my last question, I, I kind of threw a couple extras in there because I was very interested in bowling, but I can't wait to go bowling. That'd be so much fun. Um, how often do people miss that extra I in your last name and end up calling you Bob Nitro? You know, it's, it's like almost an everyday thing. And I actually had one client that enjoyed teasing me so much, he renamed me Nitro Bob. So uh, sometimes I use that as my nickname. <laughs> Bob, I have to say, Nitro is a pretty awesome last name. It's not too late to legally change it. Um, yeah, you know, you're right. I, I'm going to have to give that some thought. It's very easy to do here in Arizona. California, everything is much more tough to do. But here you can do things like, <laughs> just like that. I love it. I love it. So Bob Nitrio, five questions. Thank you so much for playing along. Very, very interesting stuff. I love how we get to learn all these cool things about people when we do this. Super fun. All right. I've got a museum pick and a tech pick. They'll be, they'll, they'll be quick. They won't take very long. Um, so Bob, my, my museum pick, and you, you probably don't know why we do even do the museum pick. Let me tell you that real quick. So I have a problem. I call it a hobby. My wife calls it a disease. I cannot throw away anything technological. Okay. Ooh. From my whole life, if it's got a screen, buttons, took batteries, or plugged in the wall, most likely I still have it. So I will be I will be uh, hauled away uh, in a in a in the loony wagon with a uh, you know what do they call that the straight jacket straight jacket. Yes, that's that's what the word I was thinking of. But in in until I'm hauled away for good, I can share my my crazy hobby with you. And so we've. Now, uh, 130, this will be the 130th show we've done a museum pick of some kind. And this one, I hope I haven't done. I look back in the notes. Um, so we've talked a lot about various interfaces over the years, especially as a sort of PC interfaces. We talked about the parallel port. We've talked about the serial port. Well, there's another one that kind of came and went and had a whole lot of mom momentum and a lot of money and a lot of companies behind it. Uh, but it didn't ultimately latch on for a few reasons. We're going to talk about that. But so my, my museum pick this week is this add-on card, because I have it in add-on card form. I'm going to hold it up to the camera here. Uh, so if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. If you're, if you're not watching on YouTube, it's basically an add-on for full card. And look what's on the back there. There's three different jacks. Now, they're kind of funny looking. Many people may not know those, but this is a Firewire card, or also known as IEEE 1394. This one is by Lucent. This one, I believe, is a, 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 a 1394A card, if I remember correctly. Um, so for what, people who don't know what FireWire is, or, or IEEE 1394, and it went by a couple different names. FireWire was Apple's name, and it was kind of the one that caught on the most. This was a kind of a, a, an alternative supplement to the USB interface. They were kind of developed at the same time, and uh, a lot of companies were pegging on FireWire to be the de facto standard for um, peripheral add-on and uh, peripheral communication. So uh, 
it, and they varied a little bit differently, but the idea was kind of the same. You plug a device into a computer and it's recognized and it starts talking to it uh, and, and that kind of thing. Bob, did you ever use Firewire? No, never use Firewire, but you know, it's funny you hold up an add-in card because it's been many years since we've actually had to deal with add-in cards. <laughs> That's with, so true. With super integration of everything on the motherboard, I'm like, what the heck? You know, I thought maybe it was, you were going to do a sound card or something like that when I saw the board. Yeah, well, we've talked about some sound cards, and I've got more of them that we'll talk about um, well, in do. future shows. But you realize yeah. that instead of a hearse, they're going to pull you back to the cemetery in one of those gut junk containers. <laughs> Probably. It'll be, it might be like some old, uh, you know, s old big server you know, back when servers were like the size of our rooms, that's what I'll be buried in. One of those yeah, kind of enclosures. Your wife is going to clean house in more ways than one if you go first. Trust <laughs> me. A guaranteed, guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to use add-on cards a lot anymore. And you're absolutely right. That's mostly because everything is so integrated. But it's also because of its competitor. The USB interface has kind of become the de facto standard for almost all inner device uh, communications, shy of networking, but in any peripheral. But it's almost also like the alternative power plug in the United States these days. It's used in everything. And, I, and Firewire, actually, at the time when it was released, it had a lot of advantages over USB. It was significantly faster. Um, it had a, a different method of doing it. So um, USB required a host controller. So the host controller kind of managed everything more like a, like a tree topology, where IEEE was much more it was designed as kind of a daisy chain approach. Um, and every device was uniquely ID'd and can talk directly to each other. Uh, that certainly increased the speeds, also ended up being kind of a security problem later, later down the road. Um, but it could support 63 devices at, at once. USB could support 128. But, uh, but, you, but Firewire had some significant van advantages. And in fact, it was catching on not only in the PC market, because companies like Apple and Sony were, were way behind this. Um, and they were, Apple was putting it out to Macs. Sony was including it on their things. It was also getting a huge following in the consumer AV industry, um, which I, I, at the time, I would have predicted that uh, Firewire would have caught on like, like hotcakes because it, it would have basically completely simplified the entire AV solution for people because it was one cable that you plug into a device and then poof, it can talk to every device in the stack. No more video cables, no more audio cables. It, could, it had a, a protocol that was added to it that where you could um, use one remote control and you could send like play stop commands to all the devices and it, it, it was all very well integrated. So can you imagine back in the day, now the think back, it's a lot easier now with HDMI, but think back when you had like component video cables and S video cables and audio video cables and you were running them over a receiver and you're running them all, all over the place and the, you had behind the stack, you had like a thousand different cables. Imagine if you could just buy one new device, plug it into whatever device you had the last, everything talked to each other, a audio video went to where it was supposed to go. It would have super simplified the industry, but alas, it didn't ultimately catch on. And for, there's a few reasons why for those who are interested. One was cost. It did cost more than USB. Uh, two was licensing. It was a licensing nightmare <laughs> for Firewire. So many companies were involved with it and had different trademarks and patents and stuff like that. Um, it, became a, uh, a very difficult for a company to come along and actually ultimately license it. Now they eventually fixed that by putting a, a consortium kind of put together a licensing package that one company could do, but that cost money. And the other problem was marketing. Sony, Sony had uh, probably the, the, the biggest backing behind IEEE 1394 and they called it Firewire. Sony called it iLink and all these other companies called it something else. So by the time all of these devices and this new interface that really had a lot of advantages and could have uh, p potentially been more popular than USB, just got lost in being called 5,000 different things. And then ultimately USB was marketed the same. It was USB and it was across the board on everything. And by the time USB 2 came out, a lot of the speed advantages that Firewire had kind of went to the wayside. And then USB kind of ultimately became ubiquitous and that's what we have today. So I guess you could call it Sony's uh, Betamax V2. <laughs> uh, yes. And what did that one stand for, Bob? Did I say that? Bad. I'm you sorry. Know, I, you got to love the Sony marketing machine. I tell this story. I, I hope I haven't told on the show before. But I, I, back in the day, long, long time ago, I sold um, AV equipment at a high-end audio video retailer. And we get these, like, Sony 
little mini stereos. And they were the gaudiest things in the world. Lights all over them, way overstyled, high tech stuff with acronyms and stuff like that. And Sony was always the, the worst with like this kind of fake feature kind of stuff. They had this feature that was plastered on, on, on the, these little mini stereos called VAX, V-A-C-S, big letters. And it's like, this bad boy's got the VAX system. Awesome. Now, Bob, do you know what VAX stood for? I have absolutely no idea. You don't want me to make something up. Trust me. <laughs> it stood for variable attenuation control system. Now, oh, do you know what that means? It had a knob that allowed you to get it louder or something. <laughs> it had a volume control. Volume. So all of that hype and acronym and big letters, basically, it had a volume control, as you would expect any <laughs> stereo to. Right. And and people like people ate that stuff up, man. It was amazing how people were behind those those kind of fake faux features to make it sound more awesome than it really was. And Sony was by far the worst when it came to that kind of stuff. And that was in the days before the Nigerian prince made his appearance on the world stage. It was, it was. Although he was my best friend, and uh, I'm glad that I helped him out. Um, I see. With, <laughs> I'm still waiting for. I'm still waiting for that bank transfer. He promised me last week. It's finally coming after <laughs> after 17 years. So, <laughs> so that was that's my museum pick anyway, and I'll do my tech pick quick. So I wanted to think of because I'm picking an add-on card. Oh my God, you don't need add-on cards for practically anything anymore, unless you really and like you like you said, sound cards are kind of the last thing where if you're a gamer and you really want to go into the high-end sound or you're doing like sound mixing or whatever, and it's really important, there are high-end sound cards you can get. But other than that, like, what do you need an add-on card for anymore? And I and I thought of one. I thought of one. If you, have, if you have a desktop computer, most likely, unless it's really new and you have a real high-end motherboard, it does not have USB-C integrated. That tends to be more on mobile devices. And there are some reasons why you might want to have it on a desktop and have like a Thunderbolt uh, kind of thing. So there are some add-on Thunderbolt 3 cards that you can get. And the one that I picked, I got a... Uh, I got, I'll just throw the new egg screen up here because this is where I found it. I haven't used it, but I would assume it would work uh, just fine. Let me throw this up here. This one is the ASRock. Uh, what do they call this? You take a look at it here. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see it. This is the ASRock Thunderbolt 3 AIC R2.0. Of course, a very memorable marketing name for such a card. But it looks like it uh, gives you a couple, a couple of Thunderbolt ports. Um, uh, display port look at in to facilitate the video here's a picture of the box there we go so if you if you need thunderbolt on a desktop that is an add-on card that exists that you could throw in a pci express one slot and make it happen what do you think pretty thin market but who knows i i would think so but you never know there are people who have thunderbolt know. devices uh, especially as Thunderbolt's kind of catching on that might have a small desktop but that didn't come with a lot of ports or whatever, and they might need to expand that out. And Thunderbolt's a really easy way to do that. So who knows? But it's an add-on card that you can put in a computer that probably your computer doesn't have built in today. I'm sure in a few years, it'll be built into everything. And there you go. So that is my museum pick, the Lucent uh, Firewire 1394A card. And my tech pick, the ASRock Thunderbolt 3 AIC R2.0 Thunderbolt 3 card. Rich, tell us what has been and what is coming in the week ahead. Uh, well, let's start with the what has been piece there. A great way to catch up on all sorts of stuff that has been in the week that was uh, is to visit channelpronetwork.com on Fridays. You will find our In Case You Missed It post there, written by our own James Gaskin every week. Um, this week, he's going to be talking a little bit about some acquisitions uh, by OpenText uh, and by NetApp. There's some new software from VMware uh, that he'll be catching you up on. Uh, there's an interesting uh, partnership between Avant Communications and Zoom for folks who uh, are partnering with either of those companies that's worth reading up on. And then he's got uh, a quick look uh, and an amusing um, uh, attempt by a company to both uh, poke fun at and maybe make a little money from the uh, all, all the toilet paper hoarding that's happening out there right now. James can take you through that. And now looking ahead to next week, you know, when we, we look ahead, typically we're focused in on events because there are so many IT events in the industry and that's where so much news breaks these days. And uh, unfortunately, there aren't a whole lot of events um, for coronavirus related reasons. So we were supposed to have 
um, CompTIA's Community Council event. That is actually going to happen online um, now. Uh, MSP World and ISC West, those have both been either canceled or uh, postponed. Uh, but you know what? The, the news never sleeps. Um, there are some stories I know coming up I can't really talk about right now. There will be uh, much to discuss next week. It just uh, won't be so much about conferences. You know, and for those who are in the, who work in the managed services model, there is another business opportunity that you, it's, might be short-lived, but toilet paper as a service. <laughs> T-P-A-A-S. Think about that as an offering to your customers in the meantime. Just make sure you find yourself a good supplier. And Thank you me. don't ever want it back. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a service you want to deliver remotely, I think. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. That is fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Nitrio. Nitrio, sorry. Uh, my, my, okay. We were talking about Bob Nitro, and now it's on my brain. Bob Nitrio, I apologize. Thank you so much for coming uh, on Channel 4 Weekly and being here with us today. It was great Thanks having you on. Thanks for inviting me to join you. It was a pleasure. I hope you had a good time. And, I always uh, I, have a good time with you guys. <laughs> and I, I absolutely hope we, uh, we have you back on uh, with us someday uh, in the near future. So for those who, uh, who, who are watching here today on YouTube, um, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you can get notified of new episodes and join us each and every week as we come out with new, new episodes for your viewing pleasure with all kinds of uh, guest hosts, guest interviews, great content, and of course, good times as well. If you, if you prefer to listen to the podcast, which I know a lot of you do, because that way you can kind of listen on your own and we love our listeners and uh, you can do other things while you, while you uh, listen to us. Uh, you can, we're on iTunes, we're on Google Play, we're on, uh, we're on Stitcher, we're on, we're on Spotify now. So pick your audio podcasting platform of choice and subscribe to us there. Uh, leave a good review and then poof, as soon as we do a new episode, it just comes down to your phone or tablet and it's there and you can listen along wherever you are and we really appreciate that. Channel4Network.com is the website. Uh, we are on Facebook, at Channel 4 Network on Facebook, Channel 4 Network on LinkedIn. We are at Channel 4 SMB on Twitter. If you want to follow Rich, you are? At Rich Free. He is that on the Twitters. I am at Matt Whitlock on Twitter. Bob, are you on the social networks? I am. I'm on, I don't really tweet much, but I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. And, uh, what, and what are you on those respective platforms? Uh, should be Bob Nitrio on both of them. Good. So look for him and follow him there. Uh, uh, definitely something that you want to do. And Bob, if people want to learn about your company, learn a little bit more about you, where would they go? Uh, they can go to ramvest.com and uh, they'll get an, uh, an idea there of what I'm doing in the uh, mobile platform world. Fantastic. We will put a link to that on our show notes page and in the description on uh, YouTube so you can find that easily. Uh, I want to give a quick, uh, another thank you and shout out to our, our sponsor of this particular episode, Corporate Armor Connect and Fix. Thank you so much for sponsoring. And that is going to wrap it up for episode 137. We will see you all next week.